All right, we should be good to go. There we are. I'm just gonna wait for some people to filter in here before we get talking, but feel free to pop questions you have in chat or introduce yourselves, whatever you like to do. We do have the Q&A section, a really convenient yep. way to actually narrow questions Ooh, away from just chat. There it is, okay, yep. yep. It's in a separate window, that's why it floated behind. I'm like, where did it go? <laughs> Can I dock it in some way? Okay. I'm going to step away for just one second before we get started. I will just be a moment. Okay, just had to get myself some water. Yes, you got the kitty can, Andy. I had a blank space to fill in because that's originally where like sponsor stuff goes and didn't think that was appropriate today. <laughs> so you got cats. It's weird not hearing people. That's not good. Usually, this one's normally good. I'll be quacking and slacking still at work. That's fair. All right, so um, I think we can probably get plowing in here. We got 52 people in chat. That's probably a good place to start. So actually, I actually forget the name of this model. We'll call him Sir Hippo for the lack of a better term for now. Um, so this is Introduction to Comic Style off the page and on the table. What I want to go through just really quickly is kind of show you guys some of the models I've done in this style, talk about my inspirations for it, and then we're going to kind of dive headfirst into a very very rapid session about how to do this style. I'm not going to paint the whole figure because that's there's not time for that, but I will definitely use some parts of this, like his head, his sword, and so on to kind of highlight the the core techniques of how I like this style. And I want to start by saying comic style is there's as many approaches to comic style as there are comic style or comic book artists, which is to say there's no right or wrong way to do this. This is what I'm teaching is sort of like my distillation of my comic influences and the comics I like um, and cartoons and video games. Like it kind of all amalgamates. And so you might see me doing something a certain way and be like, well, you know, Frank Miller would never do that. And like, okay, fine. Um, if you want to paint something based on Frank Miller's work, that's going to have a completely different look than something based on Jack Kirby's work or whatever. And you just run with your own influences. So I'm going to just be talking about where I started this style, kind of the things that influenced me, um, is stippling overkill. Stippling works really, really well if you're trying to do something more Borderlandsy or Darkest Dungeon or more of like a gritty Admiral Knopf. Thank you. I couldn't remember his name. Um, if you want something a little more of a gritty feel, like remember like a like a graphic novel kind of feel to it, um, stippling will still work really, really well for that. Um, I'll show you one or two pieces. I actually don't have any on hand based on that style because they were commissions and they've shipped out. But <laughs> um, let's go through a few, go through a couple pieces here. So what got me into doing comic style, and actually I should have grabbed it. There's a miniature I'm missing, but that's okay. Um, was the game Relic Blade. And Relic Blade is a game where the game and all the models are designed by a guy named Sean Sutter. And Sean is by trade a comic book artist. So far as I know, that's how he's been introduced to me. Um, so, you know, his backstory is not mine to tell. But anyway, um, he does all his own artwork. He does all his own sculpting. And what's cool with that is it makes his sculpts very, very true to his artwork and his vision of the characters. But what's really cool about Sean is when he has a package of miniatures, he puts that hand-drawn comic book art on the packaging instead of just pictures of the miniatures. 
And so when I first bought some of his miniatures back in, I want to say it was Adepticon 2018, I was really inspired to paint them based on sort of his vision of the characters. Um, will they be recorded for, yeah, they'll be played back on YouTube. Um, I had another one here from Relic Blade as well. Yeah, this guy. And so I really wanted my versions of the miniatures to represent the artwork on the packaging. And that's when I started really kind of delving into the style of painting. Now, before that, I had been really inspired by Gundam painters. Gundam painters actually do a lot of stuff with like an anime kind of feel to it. And I had seen some people doing initial D inspired Hot Wheels repaints, and I thought they were really cool. And I sort of distilled those ideas and the idea of painting to match Sean's artwork with inspiration from primarily from Ninja Turtles and like 90s X-Men. Those are kind of my two big and they're more cartoon than comic, but I mean, the 90s X-Men cartoon was so faithful to the comics, it's kind of indistinguishable. Um, that's sort of like where my my personal pile of experience came from, then like throwing a dash of Borderlands and, you know, a little bit of uh, Genny Tarkovsky and stuff like that. And I sort of just amalgamated all that into what I thought comic style would be. And that was really bright, saturated colors, kind of pseudo cell shading. I can talk about the difference between comic style and cell shading because they are two different things, but they're very, very close cousins. Um, and a real emphasis on black lining and contrast. And one thing you'll learn from doing comic style is you basically have 100% contrast on a miniature because you go all the way from white in your highlights all the way down to black in your shadows. You basically can't get a more readable miniature than this. And what's really cool about comic style minis is you can, you can read their pose and read the miniature from another table away. Toxic Avenger, nice. Um, I'd have to go with Michelangelo, but I'm, I'm biased. <laughs> Um, yeah, sorry, that was a little bit derailing. Um, where was I here? So it's a really good way to, if you're struggling to get, you know, really deep contrast in your miniatures, comic style is a good way to train yourself to do that. Even if you don't stick with comic style, it has a lot of things it can teach you that you can bring to your other miniatures, like really, really saturated bright colors, really vibrant highlights, and really deep, powerful shadows. The other thing it teaches that's really cool that just blows a lot of people's mind is a really fast, fun approach to doing non-metallic metals that is really easy to reproduce. And because we've probably all seen non-metallic metals represented in a comic book, it's very visually understandable. Whereas when you're trying to think of non-metallic metal in like the more traditional painterly sense, you know, it often talks about environmental reflections and light sourcing and even like sometimes you'll have things like, you know, the armor reflecting on the armor and stuff like that. And that can be a very, very challenging pile of leaps for someone to take, especially when you're newer to the hobby. And what's cool about comic style non-metallic metal is it usually has nothing to do with the environment whatsoever. In comic books, shading has more to do with creating a dynamic scene than it does with creating a realistic scene. Um, and one thing that we actually can take from that as well, I'm trying to find a piece that really exemplifies that. Um, here we go, little infinity model. So for example, the entire inside of her leg is just shaded black. There's no detail at all, I just blacked it out. Um, same thing with this leg. And the reason for that is what it creates is this sense of depth to the model. So when you sort of look at it from certain angles, the black shadow silhouettes the forward leg against the back leg. And same thing, you know, you can rotate the other way, get the same idea. And so it creates the idea that this leg is much, much deeper into the scene and you get this almost a feeling of like a broader stance. Like these were the same color, it kind of flattens everything together, pinches the model flat, right? Where you've got this light color and then this like really deep offsetting shadow, it creates this depth to the scene. And it also makes this leg feel like a more, from this angle, feel like a more dominant detail. And so we can use that I think I've got a piece, actually got one I'm in the middle of working on right now. Uh, this is Boom Howler from Riot Quest. And I actually have just started doing it. But you can see like in here, I've just got this giant blob of black and there's a lot of detail in there. I am just killing. I'm just destroying the detail. And the reason for that is I want from a lot of angles, I want this fist and the gun to kind of be the dominant detail. I don't really care that he's got a belt buckle back behind there. It's not important. What I want is you to really kind of see, you know, the gun kind of coming at you. And so having these dark shadows behind things 
creates this scene, creates this like dynamic feel to the model. Um, one of my little sort of mantras when I'm painting is when in doubt, black it out. And the idea there is that if you've got a detail that you don't know how to deal with, if it's hard to reach, or if it just doesn't seem important, you just cover it in black ink and pretend the sculptor didn't put the effort into putting it there. Um, the fun part about that is the first time I brought that up in public, the, I was using um, a miniature sculpted by Tom Mason and Tom was in the class. I'm just like, yeah, so let's pretend the sculptor didn't put this pocket here and he's sitting five feet away from me. So that was fun. <laughs> um, one thing I get asked a lot is if this is suitable for all types of models, if it only works with certain kinds. Um, you can make it work with anything. Space Marines actually work really well with it. It's just time consuming because there's a lot of panels to line, but I think they work out really, really well. This is one of my favorite pieces of all time. And I even still managed to work in a decal because the decal had nice thick black lining to it. So, or decal if you prefer. So really the amount of detail on a miniature just basically ramps up how much time you spend on black lines, but it doesn't make the miniature unapproachable. There's some hacks we can do to also get through that kind of miniature, like, um, you know, we're looking at uh, one of Iron Skull's boys here and he's got a lot of chain mail and chain mail, I don't want to sit there and outline every single bit of chain because I will die of tedium before I get through it. And so all I did here was instead of actually paying any attention to that, I just hit that with a wash of contrast black Templar and let the fact that everything else has lines on it make it feel like I put the effort in here. So when you've got a lot of detail on a model, there's basically three choices you can make. You can ignore it. I could just paint that a flat gray and not pretend there's any detail there. I can give it a black wash. I could spend the time manually inking all of it, but it's not worth the time to do, I don't think, especially for a gaming piece. Display might be a different story, but you know, this is one of four or one of 10 models. I don't want to do that. Just checking the Q&A window, we're empty over there, okay. Um, the other thing you can do, and this is a fun one, uh, this model here, this is a bear from Relic Blade, and it actually had a very heavily textured fur surface. And what I did is I took Milliput and slicked over the whole model to cover up all the fur, fill in the details, and then I sculpted in some new fur that was much more comic booky. So now this has more of a, like a Saturday morning cartoon kind of feel as opposed to, hang on, my camera's a little bit dark, there we go. Let's bring this light up a touch. All right. So yeah, I actually sculpted over, I basically reskinned the model. So the only place that's still got the original details, basically the face and the claws and everything else, I just added a layer of milliput on top of it. So that's an option too, is just re, re sort of revisiting the model, like revising the model, sorry. The last one is you just paint some detail and you ignore the rest. It's kind of like a hybrid approach. And my reference for this is I like to think of Captain America. And the reason for that is Captain America in a lot of classic comics has that sort of like a scale or like a feather texture to his uniform. And when he's on the cover of the comic, every single scale is drawn, right? They put a lot of effort into detailing the comic. Um, I hope other people can hear me. Um, can I just get a quick audio check? Are we okay? Okay, cheers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so yeah, Captain America, like when you put him on the cover, they draw every single one of those little scales, right? But when he's in an action pose somewhere in the comic, you know, it almost looked like the fur here. It'll be like one little jagged line and then a gap and one little jagged line and another gap. And you're drawing every seventh or every 10th bit of the detail and you're ignoring all the space in between. And so we can kind of bring that approach into comic style painting where like if we had, you know, if we had a lot of jagged fur here, I could paint it all as if it's a big flat surface and then just outline a little bit of fur here and a little bit of fur here and a little bit of fur here. I have some Rye Quest to paint, like all of them. So I'm looking forward to seeing you with Boom Howler. Yeah, so I have painted Boom Howler twice now. This will, I think, be my third. Um, <laughs> I can pull up a link to one on my Instagram account later. Um, I'll try and find that when we have a little, a little time or you can, you know, go digging back. So, Two other things I want to show you guys. Um, another one, this is kind of, actually three more things really quickly, then we'll get into painting. Um, this is one of the monsters from Monster Apocalypse and Monster Apocalypse was sort of like my second big, so just going back, I start with Relic Blade. Relic Blade was really, really well suited to this style of painting. You don't need to paint every single strand. Absolutely, yeah, it's, you get too busy when you paint too much of a love or repetitive detail like that, right? Especially with, especially with add, adding a black line because 
one thing we want to do in comic style painting, I keep all the colors. The way I normally think of painting is you think of like, you know, shadow, midtone, highlight. With comic style painting, I start at the midtone and work my way up to the highlight. And the reason for that is I'm going to be adding a bunch of black lines at the end. The black lines bring the tone of the whole model down. You know, they make it just visually, they, they darken everything. And so you want your highlights to be a tone brighter than normal because your shadows are a tone darker, right? And in some models, you're going to be up to like 40%, 50% black lining. And so you really, really want to have very punchy, bright colors to kind of combat that to kind of land at the same read at a distance. But then as you get closer and closer, you kind of start to dif differentiate those two things. So Monster Apocalypse came along, Privateer Press's second release of the game just a little bit after I got into this style of painting. And it's really what kind of propelled me forward because I actually did some pieces for Crystal Brush back when that was still a thing. And it's kind of what got me really, really excited about this style of painting. Um, now this piece here, I wanted to show you this one because this one specifically has some cheat codes on it. Um, I have an area where it's very, very bright. His skin is a very light pale color. And so I made sure I did a lot of line there because it shows up very well against the light pale tones. But we have a lot of darker metals in a lot of areas here. And so, for example, all of this, let's call it steel for lack of a better term, there's no black lining there at all. That is just a bunch of washes of null oil or something similar. And because that settles around details, it looks like I lined it. And because you see lining elsewhere, you, uh, you assume these are lines. And so we can use this kind of, like I call it a cheat code, where when you've got either dark areas or areas you just like are super saturated in detail, like for example, I also worked on a, a Warlord Titan and it had just all that sort of the, the inner skeletal stuff that's underneath the armor. I just, you know, started it gray and threw a black wash over it because it wasn't worth spending, you know, 70 hours of my life drawing all those tiny little black lines. I would have just lost my mind trying to do that. <laughs> so when you have, the opportunity you can use things like a wash to you know cheat a little bit and it doesn't have to be a big miniature to do that like i've got my claptrap inspired uh destructotron here and a lot of the detailing on the weapons and sort of on the chassis here is again done with a black wash and then i just brought in like one or two little lines where there was a really obviously sharp crease like this sort of this you know the circular boundary here around this little bit of the shoulder and like maybe these little hip lines and most of it otherwise is just a wash in there but because we've got this big bright yellow spot with black lining on it the black lines on the bright yellow sell the idea that the rest of them are lines they kind of they work in conjunction with each other so you don't have to do the black lining everywhere you just kind of have to like there's sort of like a critical volume you have to get done and after that the rest of it kind of feels like you've done the work even if you haven't um two last pieces I want to show here. So now with this style of painting, so far everything I've shown you, I start with a colored base coat, do my highlights, and the black lining goes on last because of course it covers things up. But one thing I was doing is I was watching some you know comic book artists in action, and of course the comic book doesn't work that way. You start with the white page, you add the black to the page, and the color comes last, right? And I wanted to try and catch that essence in a miniature at one point. And so this is what I came up with. So this miniature actually started entirely in black and white. And the color was all added with really, really thin glazes so that the black stayed black, but the white changed color. And you can see if you look, you know, the white's just ever so slightly tinted red or the black rather is just so slightly tinted red. But for the most part, it still feels black. It still reads black. And, you know, all of this white area here, that's actually just bare primer. I didn't even do anything to it. It's just got some black lines around it. And this gave me, I really love how this came out because it kind of has a real like golden age comic feel to it. It's, you know, it's a black and white image. Someone added color to as an afterthought and didn't shade the color. The shading's all done in black and white because when you go back enough in comic book history, the black and white image was the important part and color was a secondary because they may not have even had access to color printing on some, on some runs, depending on, how much they wanted to spend on it or how big the comic was. Like a lot of comics were just printed in black and white. And if they got colorized, they were lucky. And so the color was an unimportant level of detail at some point. And this kind of captured that because this model looked perfectly fine just in black and white. 
colorized by Technicolor, exactly. But so it gives me this sort of like, I feel this has a very, very Jack Kirby kind of feel. It's that era, right, where the black and white image really is important. And the black, you know, you can tell what parts are metal and what aren't because of how the black is applied. Um, one more I wanted to show you guys here. Actually, I'll grab the big version of it. So this was my attempt to do something based on Sin City, on the work of Frank Miller. And this was, again, all white primer, nothing but white primer. And then I just, just did black head to toe. Lots and lots of black lining. And then I brought in, I said, you know what? The tentacles are going to be just something different. So the tentacles got just one solid color. And so this is like a very, very minimal kind of reinterpretation of comic style, where it's just a black and white illustration with a splash of color on it. You didn't even need the color on it. Like you could do this just in black and white. But my thinking here was that, of course, in the game um, Monster Apocalypse, these are the Elder Gods, right? They're coming in from, you should show them your bust. The bust, I would love to. It's upstairs, though. Uh, I don't have it on hand. It's in a display case in my living room. Um, otherwise, yeah, I would grab that. Um, so my idea was that, of course, like these guys come from outside our reality. And so when I've got, you know, regular monsters on the table, and then suddenly this black and white illustration, he feels like he's literally from another reality. And then I like, wanted to add color to the tentacles to kind of make it like they're trying to force their way in. So that was kind of my idea with there. It actually was like, in my head, there's a story behind the painting. How similar is comic style to Grisale style painting? Grisale? So Grisale is color over a, you know, a grayscale to base color. Grisale is really French for grayscale. Um, comic style painting I start typically with nothing but a colored base coat and usually solid colors, usually bulky solid colors, minimal shading, and then black lining on top. So they're almost exact opposites of each other because Grisale starts with a value sketch with color added on. And I'm starting with color with like just blanket flat color for the most part, almost no shading at all. And then the shading is really brought in through, you know, black values. So it's almost the exact opposite of Grisale. <laughs> um, I don't think there's anything else I want to show you guys here. I've got a bunch of other random minis I can show you just if there's time at the end. Oh, excuse me. But I would like to actually get painting. So if you have any questions, do feel free to ask. I'm looking at the QA panel. There's nothing there. Uh, but we can take just a minute or two and talk about whatever you is on your mind while I get ready here. So this fellow here, um, what I want to focus on is we're going to paint his face, his head, um, probably a little bit of his belt. Cause actually I picked him out because there's the next little bit of like cloth clothing, you know, wrinkles and so on coming in here. Um, I'll probably base coat his jacket. I don't know if we'll get to it or not. And then his sword best brush for black lining. Um, I use Game Envy brushes. I use their, their, the Game Envy Artist Arsenal. So it's normally the size zero and size triple zero I use for lining. Anything that's long and slender. Um, actually, that's one thing we'll talk about. We'll talk about ink really, really quickly. So I have two favorite products for this, for black lining. One is Higgins Black Magic. And this is actually an artist ink. It's used by comic book artists for inking comics and that kind of inking. It works really, really well in miniatures. I like it because it's a semi-matte ink, and most inks are not matte. So most inks are very, very glossy. It's a semi-matte. You still want to hit with a matte varnish, but it's not like going to kill it if you don't. But it's also, it's very smooth and just insanely opaque. And that opacity is what I really am, that's my most valued thing in an ink is how opaque it is. Because when I'm sitting in here, like I'm coming on the, you know, this Stormcast, for example, and I'm trying to get these, you know, hundred tiny little scratch lines, these little hatch marks across the shoulder to give a sense of a little bit of shading. I don't want them to be translucent and have to go in and do them twice because you're not going to put two tiny little hair thickness lines in the same place. Oh, we actually have some. How do you feel about dry brushing in comic style? I think dry brushing gives you a really, really good gritty look. And I think it really suits itself to things like if you have a Borderlands or my favorite two are Borderlands and Darkest Dungeon that kind of like, um, sorry, excuse me. I need some water. Borderlands and Darkest Dungeon are my two favorite sources of inspiration where dry brushing really works well. Um, but they're not, it's not exclusive to that. It, it works well for a lot of places. Actually, the skin on this guy here 
actually this was airbrushed sorry you can actually see some splatter here and i actually did that intentionally because i wanted it to look like it was just dirty is inking different than shading yes yes um and preferred blacks for lighting actually we're in the middle of that question right now so let me get back to that and then we'll take yours here one second um, so there's three inks I use. I'm trying to find the other two because they're up on the shelf, but they're hiding behind some other inks because I use black magic almost all the time. Now. Um, in order, that one, the Dale around. I can't find the Dale around. Where are you? You're hiding in the very back of my shelf, of course. Yeah. So if I had to rank them, Higgins is my favorite. Dale around is my second favorite, but it became really, really hard to find in Canada about two years ago right when I, you know, start doing a lot of this work. So I had to find alternatives. Liquitex Carbon Black is pretty good as well. It tends to be a little bit translucent. So every once in a while, you'll have to repeat a stroke to cover it up. And I don't like having to do that. Like my, my approach to painting in general is one and done. What you'll see when I paint is if I can get away with doing a single coat instead of doing two thin coats, I will do so because painting fast is kind of like just one of my preferences. I like things that work quickly and do their job one time. Um, and so like Higgins Black Magic and Dale Rowney are just ever so slightly more opaque than Liquitex is. And I'm talking like 99%, 98%, 94%. Like they're still, they're still more opaque than any black paint you'll use. Um, and just to touch on that, you can do your lining with black paint, but it's, Paint dries on your brush faster than ink does. Have you ever tried Tammy Panel Liner? I have not. I've never seen a store that carries it, and I'm very leery about ordering it online. We'll talk about that later if we have time. Lining with an oil wash. So a wash isn't a line. A wash will give you a blurry edge, and we want sharp, crisp edges. So like that's the exact kind of like they're they do kind of the same detail, but you get different results, right? Anytime you use a wash, a wash has smooth feathered edges to it right and that's kind of the definition of what a wash does it kind of gives you that you know like a gradient and we want crisp sharp edges and that's why a super opaque black is much more important uh, i'm going to start doing some base coats on here while i talk because i can kind of do that numb <laughs> so i'm going to pick out some um just some darker red for his jacket um I didn't actually decide what color he was going to be before the show, which was probably a bit of a failure on my part. We'll do just grave digger denim. I'm going to do a skin in like a bit of a blue tone. So I'm going to use some grave digger denim and some underbelly blue. And we'll bring the red up into his hat as well. Sword. Sword, we will do. Actually, we'll just do that in gray. So we're going to grab just uh, iron claw, maybe. Okay. And so I'm just going to get some base coats going while we talk. Uh, no other questions in there. Cool. Yeah, so you can use washes. And like I said, I use washes as a bit of a cheat code when something is just like a detail saturated area. And I don't want to like, don't want to put too much effort into working on it. But one thing you'll find is that washes, like, I won't bring like Nolan Oil or, you know, Agrex or Shade or a similar product into these too often because it does give you that like smooth feathered edge to your shadow. And I want very, very crisp, harsh shadows, right? Micron pens, um, I've used them. The problem I find with them is that when you start working on larger models like this, the tips wear out really quickly. Um, I did a model where I went through two Micron pens just lining a single model. And at like five bucks each, you know, it cost me 10 bucks to line that model. And that's a really uneconomical way to go about make painting your miniatures. <laughs> <laughs> the the little tips on micron pens can wear down very very fast they're not yeah so i usually save them for doing things like when i'm trying to get like some freehand lettering done something like that then i'll come back with the micron pen but i won't use them for um you know for just general line if i need a very very crisp singular line i might lean on them now, some places like, for example, if you're trying to do some work based on, like you're picking out your Hellboy minis and you're trying to paint them in the most Mike Magnola way you possibly can, you're probably going to want to use some pens because one thing you'll notice if you go look at Mike Magnola's work is his lines have very, very consistent weights. 
Um, where can you buy inks? Almost any good art store will carry inks. Um, I usually get them from Michael's here in Canada. But practically any art store, you'll look in the calligraphy section as opposed to, you know, the painting section and stuff like that. But yeah. Oh, actually, I should have mentioned calligraphy ink works pretty well as well. I've used a uh, speedball super black to some good effect. One thing you'll always want to do when you try a new ink out is test it for water fastness. And the reason for that is that with speedball ink, I had an area I was trying to um, glaze with a little bit of a um, little bit of GW Serif from Sepia after I had already inked a model. I just wanted to like, I was tinting a windshield on a Hot Wheels car actually. And the Seraphim Sepia, whatever's in it, made the ink become fluid again. And then it ran into everywhere the Seraphim Sepia was. And I suddenly had just a big blackish puddle across the surface of my miniature. Everywhere I had put the wash, the ink ran into it and they kind of coagulated together and bad things happened. Yeah, so the thing to do is if you want to throw down a speedball ink like that, is just varnish the model before you do anything. Like, if you have any touch-ups to do, varnish before you do the touch-ups, that's all. Um, but yeah, you can basically get away with, almost any ink will work fine on a miniature. It's just a matter of, you know, try and do a little test spot. If you can like, you know, grab an extra bit or, you know, a cheaper miniature or even just like the back of a plastic spoon or something and just like throw some paint down do a little bit of ink, you know, literally just scribble on it with some ink and then just test it with your, any other parts of your process you wanna use, whether you're planning on, you know, washing over top of it or whether you need to, you know, varnish it later. Cause some inks will actually reactivate when the varnish hits them too. I haven't had that happen in a long, long time, but I had one model forever and a day ago get ruined by that. Um, before I was doing comic style, it just happened to be just a model that had some inks on it, but. I think it was actually, um, oh, we got one question. Can you use the same brush for ink or should you use, I use the same brushes for everything. Um, yeah, I'm not a stickler for having separate brushes for different things, except oil paints. Oil paints I'll keep separate brushes for, but inks, most inks tend to be acrylic based anyhow. And so, you know, on some level they have characteristics in common with, um, with your acrylic paints, right? They're, they're not gonna be exactly the same, but they have, some common ancestry. Um, we must have just a little grave digger denim for his head. So I'm just gonna throw some base coats on a few details here and then we will talk about the inking process. So when I'm inking, I kind of break it down into, there's sort of three steps I work through. Um, the first one is just working a wit my way around a model and separating details from each other. So that's like on this guy, it'd be, you know, separating his belt from his jacket, you know, his jacket from this front panel, his, you know, head from his neck, his hat from his head, etc. Like working around the model and just drawing a line along the boundary between two details. And that's sort of like step one is just break the model down into its constituent parts. Um, step two is kind of doing the same thing for the details in the details. Like if a shirt has a pocket, but you know, they're going to be the same color. You might want to draw a line around the pocket or at least under the pocket. Um, this guy's actually doesn't have a lot of that because he's a lot of big flat surfaces and that's actually really helpful for this style. It also means that there's like a whole step I get to skip. <laughs> and I didn't really think about that when I picked him, but in general, so you'll see, I do really sloppy base coats. Um, that's just my thing is I paint fast and I'd rather make a mistake and fix it than slow down enough to not make a mistake in the first place. That's just my approach to painting is sometimes it's easier to ask forgiveness than to seek permission, that kind of approach. So I get a little bit of skin tone on his hat. It's easy to fix. Um, now the next, the third stage of black inking is adding in deep shadows. And that's where I'd bring you know, the black underneath the arm between the legs. I might drop a little extra black around this uh, little sash here to kind of indicate a bit of a drop shadow. Um, and then the last one is the details in the details. And so that's, you know, doing my metallic work on the sword, um, you know, maybe giving him like little wrinkles on his knuckles, maybe bringing out the wrinkles in the pants just a little bit more. And so it's sort of, you know, break the model up, break the model up again, add your big shadows, and then finally just, you know, embellish. And the cool thing with the embellishment step is the details don't actually have to be there for you to draw them. 
Like if I decide this guy had really wrinkly skin, but the sculptor sculpted him with really, really smooth skin, I can just ink in some extra little wrinkles. And it adds to the idea of this being a comic character because you just got drawn on detail. Um, you know, I might actually do with a character like this, I may actually draw in little like squiggly spots on his jacket and then fill it in with a little bit of brown paint because there's like a mud stain there or something like that. And you know, it's a it's a very simple kind of form of weathering that works really well on comic style. Um, yeah, for example, actually I've got one on here on this guy. This is a mechano shredder, and I've got a couple little tiny rust spots. And the rust spot is just a little bit more than basically like a black outline in the shape of a peanut with a little bit of you know an earthier tone just stuck in the middle. And that's about it. You know, there's it's a tiny, tiny bit of freehanding that takes 20 seconds to add to the model. Um, kind of did the same thing mm -hmm. on this Marine. You can see I've got little sort of like dimples that like there's no, there's nothing there, right? That's a big flat panel. But I, you know, drew basically like an elongated letter C and put some little scratches in it to kind of indicate there's a bit of a drop shadow here. And so you get the idea of it being like a little like scoop out of the armor. And there's nothing there, right? Like that, that's just 100% imagined. Um, same kind of idea here, a little bit of a, little bit of a, just a, almost like a peanut shape and just put some scratches in it to make it feel like there's a shadow to it. So let's just get some base coats back on here. So I'm gonna lighten up his head just a little bit more in a minute. Um, so my, the important part here is really, really consistent flat base coats. I don't want to see you know, uneven colors because I'm going to be building my blacks on top of this. And I don't want to, like, once you've got the black down, you really don't want to have to go back in and fix anything. You know, once you're, once you're doing your black inking, you're kind of like, that is your finishing steps. I mean, even though it's probably like half the process at that point, all your colors should be laid in. And there's, there is the opportunity to go back in and brighten things up if you need to, because what you'll find is like, this jacket, if I started, I purposely started with a bit of a darker red. Like I normally would go with like Kador red base. And if I start adding black line to this now, this red will feel even darker still. It starts to almost feel like a maroon. And so I'm going to actually highlight one side and not the other just to kind of illustrate that. They are absolutely the painting version of cross hatching. So the, they're, they're hatching as opposed to cross hatching. Cross hatching is when you cross, you literally do two series and they overlap. Um, miniatures are too small to do that with for the most part. So you just do one series of diagonal as opposed to doing crossed, which is just two series of lines. That's the, the specific difference between hatching and cross hatching is just like whether there's one set of lines or two for the most part. And a bigger miniature you can get away with cross hatching. Um, let's actually get that color on his hand here as well because we'll probably get to painting this a little bit over here. Uh, how are we doing for time here? We're 36 minutes in. Okay, we're doing good. Yeah, again, my base coats are sloppy, especially when I'm trying to just teach a couple details. It doesn't matter what the cuff looks like right now. <laughs> um, I am going to bust out, we'll do the sword handle in more of like a gold color. So take notes, you're going to get a free lesson on non-metallic gold in comics. Non-metallic gold in comic style. <laughs> so I wasn't planning on that, but I think it's really well suited to it, so might as well. Did I hear these vids will be up on YouTube? Yeah, they'll be up on the uh, Reaper YouTube channel at an unknown date in the future. I don't know the exact date because they don't know either. <laughs> um, so I want to do for, for doing a gold, I like to start with a, like a rich warm brown. Yeah, no worries, no worries. So I'm gonna start with just a little bit of um, Citadel Scrag Brown here. And I'm not too concerned, like if I get a little bit on his fingers or something. So one other thing I do with black inking is use it to hide mistakes. And what I mean by that is, for example, when I'm painting, you know, his belt and his shirt here or his jacket, if a little bit of the color of the belt ends up on the jacket, I'll just make my black line a little, as opposed to spending time going back and correcting it later, I will bring the black line up just a little bit higher on the jacket to cover up that um you know that little blemish right you can kind of just you can because the black ink is so opaque 
you can use it to hide all sorts of mistakes. You know, if I, um, short of just like literally putting paint in the wrong spot, you can almost always hide something in black ink, whether you, you know, make a tiny little shadow or treat something as a little weird embellishment. Um, you can use mis like black inking to just mask some of your mistakes. And what's also really neat is like, you know, when I'm even working on, you know, the belt and the jacket, you know, it doesn't matter if I leave a little gap between them because I'm going to be filling out with black later. So you don't have your, your colors don't have to exactly meet in the middle. You can kind of leave that little empty spot. And that can be really, really beneficial because sometimes getting your paints to exactly meet at a crease on a model, especially if it's a really, really sharp crease can be really, really challenging and frustrating depending on the sculpt. And so being able to omit that step in painting and just go, yeah, it's okay if there's just a little tiny white line of primer showing there because I'm going to hide it later is really, really a fun way to just deal with, you know, things you don't want to deal with. <laughs> and like I say, when in doubt, black it out. If you've got something you just don't know what to deal with, if it's in a place you can hide it with black ink, just go ahead and hide it with black ink. Um, you want to throw down just a little bit of gray on the sword and then we'll probably highlight his head a little bit because that's a pretty dark, very, very dark color there. Actually, this sword is going to be too dark too. This is one thing I find with comic style painting, even having done it now for years, is that I constantly, like normally this would be a really, really acceptable mid-tone. And with comic style painting, because I'm going to be bringing the black ink into it, and I want to make sure the black is easy to read, and so you want to have like a good distance between black and your next color up. Even this might be too, a uh, little bit too light, or a little bit too dark, rather. So I'm going to just mix a little bit. I've got underbelly blue here. I'm just going to skew the color a little bit with it. That's looking a little better. So you can see the paint's here still pretty damp, so I'm going to just come back to that in a minute. Let's uh, just rebase coat his knuckles. And actually, what I'm going to do, I'm also just going to throw some gold on this cuff. We've got the color out, and it feels kind of appropriate. And I feel like if we at least kind of have like a segment of the model done, it'll be a little more complete feeling. So let's... Uh, Let's just do the same over there. Hiding mistakes with black lines is very freeing. This could be a problem for me. I really lean towards darker tones and almost anything. So that's, yeah, it, comic style painting, because when you start adding in a lot of black ink, the black ink really just visually tones the model down. And so you do need to start very vibrantly first. Um, and then let the black kind of create your deeper values. Uh, one thing that's kind of funny to me, and it's actually when I first, the very, very first miniature I did as a tutorial for this is actually a Reaper mini, um, one of the deep ones. And so if you go back to my YouTube channel and look at my comic style playlist, it's the first video up there. And I edited that video. And then I sat on it for four months, worried I didn't want to release it. And the reason why is that I right off the bat say exactly what I'm telling you guys right now. I go, hey, you need to make sure you're picking really, really bright colors because if you start adding your black to it and it's not bright enough, you're not going to notice the black enough. And then I base coat pretty much the whole model in what feels like a mid-tone blue. And it ends up being a very, very dark blue by the time I go to put the black on it because I didn't even really notice I'm doing the black work. I'm like, oh. And so in this, you know, what I kind of consider my definitive tutorial at the time I make a big mistake of telling you to pick a bright color and then picking a dark color. And at some point I finally went, you know what? No, I'm going to just narrate this in such a way that I explain the mistake I'm making as I make it. And I'd rather show people, show people the failure because I learned more from screwing up than I ever did from getting things right. And that's kind of just key to painting in general is like be really, really okay with screwing up. Uh, Reaper, I don't have that color on hand. I've only I promised half my Reaper paints are in storage right now. Um, 
that one. Let's see, I've only got, oh, I've got like 150 Reaper paints, but I don't use, they're my daily writers right now. Um, okay, I'm just gonna do one more quick coat here. I need to see a little bit of the blue showing through. And so you can see my painting process is very, very, leans towards very opaque base coats. I pick my colors based on how quickly I know they go down now. I'm gonna just mix a little bit of underbelly blue into that Gravedigger denim. And I'm going to do one set of highlights. Screen just flashed there. I hope that's not. <laughs> have you used Chimera paint? I have not. My plan was to pick it up at Adepticon last year, and of course, COVID. So, <laughs> um, someday I will, but it's not going to be anytime soon. So, when I'm doing highlights in comic style, so this is where we talk about the difference between comic style and cell shading. And when I say the differences, it's all there's a lot of similarities too. So, cell shading harkens back to cellophane animation where you know characters were drawn by hand and they probably had no shading at all or if they did the shading was done with just solid color blocks that followed very very simple geometric shapes and the reason for that was that you know they had to be reproducible by an artist from one frame to the next and so you don't you know with very very few exceptions you don't see for example cross hatching in a cartoon because it's impossible to put the tiny little black lines in the same place every single frame. And so if you, you know, get them in the wrong spot, then it looks kind of jumpy and sketchy and weird. And that's usually the kind of thing that's reserved for like, you know, strange little art house projects and not really for like, you know, proper animation. Um, I've heard the red is insane. I have heard that too, but again, haven't had a chance to try it. So I'm just going to do, so the idea here is when you're doing something with more of like a comic ins or a cartoon inspiration or a cell shade inspiration, you want your shadows and your highlights to have very, very kind of almost like geometric shapes. Like they follow really simple, easy to reproduce curves. And that's kind of the, the idea here. Um, now, if I wanted this to feel, you know, a little more like a modern comic, I would do more, you know, more gradients because modern comics tend to be colored digitally. And once you start coloring things digitally, you can add, you know, an infinite amount of texture and gradients to things and it's no extra effort compared to doing this. So that's why I say like, there's no right or wrong way to do comic style because there's thousands of different comics out there and they all have different approaches to things and you'll get a different, different style if you're, you know, using a comic book from the 1960s than if you're using a comic book from yesterday, right? They're going to be completely different in how they approach color, how they approach black. And so you can kind of pick and choose your references. If you know you really, really like a dark gritty feel, um, I would do a lot of like a lot of dry brushing, a lot of stippling first, build up your textures, and then just add the black as sort of a final product. And you can get a really, like say, Darkest Dungeon is a great example of that. Whereas if you look at the art of Darkest Dungeon. Now, of course, it's a video game, not really a comic, but it's got a very comic book vibe to it. But if you kind of look at the art, you zoom in on it, you kind of just deconstruct it. It's a lot of really, really gritty texture. It's almost got like a watercolor feel to it. And the black line is just done on top of that. Um, and so you get, on Borderlands, it's kind of the same way. They're very gritty, heavily painted textures. Borderlands art feels like someone did all their homework and then colored on it with a Sharpie. And that's not a bad thing. It's just, it's very, very unique to their, I won't say it's completely unique, but it's very recognizable as being its own kind of, you know, source of inspiration where there's a lot of texture, 
you know, under the surface and then just like literally lining all over it with Sharpies. And it works. Let's um, pop. So I'm just going to grab same color on his knuckles here. So I'm doing these sort of like this is a very cell shade inspired kind of highlight where it's just a big single chunky highlight. And that's about it. And I love doing this because it's fast, it's rapid, and it's striking. Like it doesn't take a lot of work to make, you know, a highlight the shape of an oval look good. You know, there's not like a little bit of a zigzag here, just kind of following that little natural cur curve in the model, but then it all just sort of comes back together. And I took, you know, probably two coats to cover that, but it still gives us enough space to add some black up underneath the head. And here, so back, I'm going to follow basically like the top of the top sort of third or top half of each of these knuckles. Leave the bottom half, you know, the darker blue. And then just have them join together across the back of the hand. And that's it for highlighting. We're, you know, that's the full highlighting step for the skin anyway. Um, the jacket, I'm going to do basically the same idea. We are kind of bouncing back and forth here. I'm kind of doing skin and clothing and metals, kind of like not in a linear fashion. So if you have questions, do feel free to ask them. I'm kind of jumping around too much. Let me know and I can probably try and rein that in a little bit. Oh, good, the kitty's coming back to the kitty cam. So here, what I want to do is I tend to think of my highlights as just like an, you know, sunshine at noon on an overcast day. So like I, I put them, you know, kind of straight down on the model. Um, that's sort of the easiest way to approach them. Now, the thing with um, comic style is highlights in comic books, light sources in comic books, really have very, very little to do with their environment. Um, like, for example, think of Batman the Animated Series, or almost any Batman comic. And it can be pitch black, and his eyes are glowing white. I mean, like, they're set literally, you know, as a white eye against a black mask in a black background. Sometimes his eyes are the most defining part of an entire panel. And there's no reason for that. His eye, you know, there's not like a light source glinting off his eyes. He doesn't have a visor with, you know, white optics in it. You know, they're just, it's just dramatic. Um, it's a dramatic tool, right? It, it's something used to, you know, draw your attention to him in the scene, to his expression. It gives him a sense of motion, kind of tells you where he's looking, what he's doing. And that, you know, that sense of dynamic movement and that sort of sense of importance that it creates is far more important than the fact that like there's no reason for them to be there. And that's true of a lot of things in comics where like you'll get shadows used to to like push a detail into the background or to pull another detail into the foreground. So you'll get shadows where they don't really belong because it's just an easy way of making the scene more dynamic and we can use that in our miniature painting we're like as i'm adding these highlights to these sh you know i'm adding highlights to his shoulders and it's meant to kind of give him like a good sense of volume and it's working but i mean i could add some highlights down here as well if i want to kind of like maybe make it feel more like there's a little motion happening here or if you know i need to just kind of make his legs feel even less important i you know contrast them with this highlight yeah, so I'll bring that in here. And then I don't want to bring it up under the arm because I'm probably going to have a dropped shadow there. And I don't want my highlight right beside my shadow because that doesn't make sense. But, you know, I can do a little little highlighting work here to kind of almost make it feel like these tails are floating out a little bit more, even though they're really not. We're using illustrative techniques of, you know, creating these, these movement volumes. And we're doing it with like two colors. And I can go back and blend these back to that base coat red as much as I want, or I can you know, leave them in this more cell shaded kind of style. Which way you go with that is up to you, how much time you want to put into something. 
um, you know, what you're trying to get out of it, where your source of inspiration come from. And what I really, really love about comic style painting is just the body of reference I get to work from because, you know, if you're painting, you know, let's say you're painting a space marine and you're trying to do some, you know, lens OSL, you're trying to make his eyes glow a little bit. You're probably going to end up looking at other people who've painted the exact same thing as your reference. You're going to be looking for other people who've painted a space marine and done an eye glow on it and seeing where that glow lies and so on. And when I'm doing comic style painting, I, I run, I fall into that trap too. I often just look at other people who've done the exact same work I have before me as a reference. And it, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not talking out against references, but what I'm trying to say is that when you're doing comic style painting, every comic book that's ever existed, every animation frame that's ever existed, work for you as reference. You know, if I want to do a glowing blue effect, I'll go look at Iron Man comics because there's going to be a hundred places in one quick Google search that show me his arc reactor glowing, his repulsors glowing, his eyes glowing, and different comic book artists will have different ways of actually showing that. Um, the most common one, for example, is to have your black lines around the glowing element be blue instead. So instead of having a black line, you have a blue line. And what that shows is that when you've got black lines everywhere else in the model and blue lines are on this one thing, it actually makes that thing feel brighter because of course, I mean, visually it is brighter. But you can use, you know, the techniques of, you know, a hundred years of comic book artists now to inform how you want to paint something. And there's going to be a lot of different approaches. There's on a really, really quick spotty highlight. Uh, I'm going to just, the one across the bottom here, I don't love it. I'm going to feather that out. What I'm just mixing is a little bit of a 50-50 color between my two reds, just to kind of kind of hit in the middle here. And then I'm just going to go back to my base coat red and feather that out a bit. Okay. Um, I'm going to actually, just before I move into go any further, I'm going to just add some color to his monocle there. I'm not going to worry about the lens right now. I just want to have, when I go to paint the black lines on his face, I want this to have a little color so it stands out. So I'm not worried about that yet. We always come back in and paint the monocle later. Any questions at all? Am I uh, bouncing around too much? Anything you'd like to know that I've kind of just glossed over? Or are we gonna just kind of keep plowing through? How does this work for smaller scale minis? Um, it works pretty well, it's just, the smaller the details get, the more time consuming the model gets. Uh, like for example, this is an Infinity Mini, and Infinity Minis are probably the epitome of like scrunched up, tiny detail saturated pieces. And like, for example, right here in the knee, I've got like what, these little braided cords. And I kind of blacked out every second one and then just added some quick little highlights ones that were left. There's a lot of little detail like around the belt. Um, it comes down to deciding how much detail you want to work on and how much you want to ignore. Cause like, for example, a lot of infinity minis have like an undergarment that's like covered in little like imprinted hexagons. And I would suggest you just pretend they're not there. <laughs> Cause you know, the more, the more detail there is in a mini, the longer you're going to spend adding your black lines, but you can also, choose which lines not to add. You don't have to line every single detail the sculptor provided. You can gloss over some of it. Now, I mean gloss as in ignore, not gloss as in use a gloss varnish. I guess that's a really terrible term to be using in a painter setting. Um, you can ignore a lot of detail and just, you know, black out what you feel is important. Um, so I'm going to do just a very quick little bit of the non-metallic work, and then we're going to bounce back to the black lining. I shouldn't say back because we haven't started it yet, but we've got, we've got an hour left. Okay, so if we do 20 minutes of color and then 40 minutes of black, I think we'll be good. 
I just make sure I don't miss anything here. So I'm going to go into just a little bit of Avril and Sunset for the gold now. Um, any kind of bright okra sort of color works really well here. Um, P3 mediocre. I've got some, I've got a reaper paint actually used here somewhere, but I forget which one it is. My reaper paints are unfortunately higher up on my shelf. My biggest problem normally is deciding which shade highlights my base color best. That is, yeah. Honestly, that, that's a thing that comes with practice more than anything. Um, I can actually do these. So when I want to indicate a texture is metallic as opposed to cloth, I tend to make the highlights kind of have this like almost like a zigzaggy pattern. Think of letter H's or letter Z's. Um, my idea is that when things are metallic, like light glints off them differently. And I sort of try to catch that in my highlights. You can see here, I'm using a pretty ratty big brush for this. I do the, a lot of my, one of my philosophies is that I should always paint with the biggest brush I can get away with because, oh, get off there. You know, um, I ran into a trap years ago where I was just doing everything with like an 18 zero and miniatures were taking me, you know, days and days and days to paint. I'm doing one of the dice adventurers using the pink reference die on our Instagram. There you go. So those dice adventures are perfect for this too. They're a really good example of this. And because they're basically simple geometric shapes, it's actually, it's pretty, there's a lot of fun things you can do with the highlighting. But yeah, so I sort of, in recent years, have kind of come to the ethos of try and do whatever you can with the largest brush you can, because if you're using a smaller brush, you're just probably wasting time doing extra detailing. It's not necessarily true, but it seems to work in my favor more often than not, so I go with it. So here, for example, I'm going to kind of taking that, you know, top down shading ethos. I'm going to just my, have my brightest point. This is the tallest point of this gold. So this is going to start being bright here. And I've got a little bit of mold line right there. You just got to fill in. And so that I'm going to kind of, you know, bring my highlights in a bit of like, say, almost like a it's not really a letter H anymore because there's like four layers to it, but it's kind of got that sort of that banding. And then I might add just because I find the metals work really, really well. If you almost treat them like a checkerboard. So I'm going to add a little bit more of a highlight down here. And so I kind of got, you know, shadow, highlight, shadow, highlight, shadow. As like just this, your old iBot sculpt to work well for this. Yes, it would actually, yeah. Um, actually, just to talk to that for one second, I can't believe someone remembers that. Um, I did a re reimagining of the iBot for World's End Publishing. So this will be coming to their site for This Is Not a Test, their Fallout inspired miniatures game, or their not Fallout miniatures game. But he's got, you know, things like buzz saws and flamethrowers instead. So <laughs> um, I don't know when they're releasing it. I think last time I talked to him, he was having trouble sourcing flight stands for it. So I'm not sure if he's actually have that for retail yet or not. I'll actually go bug him about it soon. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. But yeah, that model will be perfect for it because it's basically just like some simple geometric shapes with, uh... when did this happen? I sculpted it like two or three years ago and it's just been a really long production <laughs> because he said trouble getting uh, flight stands and then COVID happened and yeah, it's, it's someone else's business. It's not mine to discuss, but I know I did the sculpt a few years back. So what I'm doing here is I'm kind of establishing that same checkerboard and it's like sort of a three dimensional checkerboard. You've got a, you know, a highlight here and then, you know, dark highlight, dark highlight. And then imposing that is where there's the dark, there's a highlight where there's the highlight, there's dark. So I want to add one more highlight in here. 
And this sort of checkerboarding works really, really well to let you know something. It's not a fabric. Like it just, it already starts to feel metallic just from a little bit of that. And then we can just keep on going, kind of building that sort of, that technique up. I'm going to use some uh, Cygnus yellow here, go really, really bright. Yeah. Hey pups, what's going on, bud? So here on the cuff, I'm probably going to just kind of keep it towards the top because there's not really a reason for the be a highlight underneath. We can talk about balance light, but you know, like I say, in comic books, lighting almost has nothing to do with the scene it's in, which is fun. As an overthinker who gets caught up in tiny details and loves tiny brushes, I'm pretty excited for the challenge. Yeah. The fun thing is in this detail, this style of painting, you can focus on or omit as much detail as you want. I mean, I guess the thing is like, that's true of regular miniature painting, but I think it's easier to get your head around in this style. And that's why the thing I love about comic style painting is it's such a good teaching tool, even if people have no intent to like stick with it at all, because like you learn about contrast, you learn about like non-metallic metal in a more kind of like understandable way for some people. Um, you know, really, really, it can really get you out of your shell or out of your rut if you're having trouble like making your colors brighter. You know, if you're constantly, you know, my old paint technique hundred years ago now was to just like base coat things and cover them with Devlin mud and then add some highlights to them, right? And every model was like flat and lifeless. They're just, you know, even, you know, the best highlighted parts were still, you know, dull by my current reckoning. And if someone had taught me this style of painting, even just as a teaching tool, like you don't have to stick with it. You don't have to like decide that you're going to go all in on comic style painting, but it works really well as a way to get kind of like, because you get to, you jump into just such an unfamiliar or different territory, it can really break down a lot of your habits because you're almost just like, you're painting in almost in a different medium. Even though you're still using your regular paints, you're still using your regular miniatures. Because you put your head into a completely different space when you're thinking in comics, as opposed to thinking in miniatures, you can really, really get out of some, I don't want to call them bad habits, but you know, you can kind of um, get away from things that may be holding you back from pushing your painting just into the next level. We use just a tiny, tiny bit of white. I'm just going to add, you know, just to this top part here, I'm just going to do a little sketchy highlight through the middle. And it's just, you know, little lines kind of traveling the direction of the metal. And so the idea there, I'll do the same thing when we get to the sword here, but like when you pull for example, when you sharpen a sword, you sharpen it lengthwise, right? You, you run a whetstone along the blade. And so any scratches in the blade will run the length of the blade. So any of your highlights should also be kind of little zigzaggy bits going the direction the blade is. So at the hour mark, I would like to remind all to cast your vote for the poll, choose a faction and pick Golden. Okay, do that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you talking. No, no, you, you jump right in. That, that's not a problem at all. So I'm gonna just add a little more of this. Now this is, we've done this all right now just with pure highlights. There's no black inking yet. What I'm doing though, you'll see there's a really big gap between this highlight and this highlight. I'm leaving room to add some black in here is what I'm doing as I do this. I probably should have mentioned that earlier, but yeah, I'm leaving just a little bit of space to make an extra dark spot in the middle. Um, just bring a little bit of that highlight onto his, his optic here. We got just a little bit of time for this. So we're going to dive into the black really, really soon. So all I want to do before I do the black now is just get a little bit of a highlight on that sword. And then we're just going to dive right into the comic style black because that's, that's my fun part. That's the part I love doing. Um, you'll see there's a couple of pieces I've in my little rotator thing here. I actually don't know if I put them in. Um, this little dead right over there that are just black and white. Um, 
Boom Howler was a good example. I don't know if I've got them in there though or not. And I really, when I'm working with um, private coaching students, I really like to try and get them to do a pure black and white piece just as an exercise because you really force yourself to think about where shadows and highlights live when you have to do them entirely in black and entirely in white. And so it's a really cool thing to just prime a model all white and then just sit down with your black ink and just kind of like start to work on the illustration of the miniature. So if you've got time, Gus or Mini, I definitely recommend trying to do a black and white illustration. And, you know, you can pull up all sorts of comic book art to kind of get good ideas for how to go about that. Just going to touch a little bit of a highlight into the... You see me pop up like a little hedgehog there or a little groundhog. I'm just looking to see if there's any questions in the Q&A because it's on a different monitor. <laughs> um, all right, sword. That's where I want to go next. So I've got my white on the palette. I'm just going to bring my like a big uh, helping of the white into the gray I'm using, which unfortunately is just off my palette can. Can I bring that? There we go. So the sword, I want it brightest along this edge to kind of indicate that it's sharp. So let's just start by drawing, just using the flat of my blade or the flat of my brush just along the top of the sword. When I say the flat, you can see I'm actually bringing the brush across it as opposed to using the point of the brush, I'm using the side. And anywhere you've got like nice sharp geometry, you can use that to grab the detail. Just bring this up here. I'm going to kind of just almost outline the sword in white. I'm only going to do the front facing of it because I want to just not be too repetitive and save a little bit of time. And then same thing kind of here. Now I want to skew it to the top of the sword as opposed to the side. So I'm, you know, working just from this angle. So that's kind of where the paint lands as the, uh, as it catches that edge. And trying to just kind of make that line weight be roughly the same. And now that's pretty boring. Doesn't look great, but it's just a step. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I want this tip here to be pretty bright. And this is where, again, I start to kind of work on the checkerboard. So I'm going to, you know, kind of skew that. And then so we've got, you know, dark, light. This is going to be dark in here. So now I kind of want somewhere around maybe a third of the way down the sword, I want a bit of a light section. And I'm running my brush strokes in the direction of the sword. And that's just, again, kind of trying to get that feel of like, that's the way the whetstone flows, right? That or not flows, but goes. As you sharpen a sword, you sharpen it lengthwise, not, you know, side to side. I hope. <laughs> I hope that's how you're sharpening your swords. You all own swords, right? Um, and so again, here coming to this part, we want to, you know, hit our checkerboard. So I'm going to have the highlight be, you know, opposite the dark spot on the upper surface of the sword. Then we're going to have a dark spot alternating that light spot. And then we can go with a bright spot here again. And I'm going to just try and catch that edge of the sword a little bit and keep those flowing keep the line work flowing the direction of the blade. I have some nice <laughs> kitchen knives. Fair enough, fair enough. And if that feels a little bit scribbly, you can kind of just, you know, I'm going to fill in the middle of that just a little bit, just give a little more volume to those colors right there. Um, and then just to complete the checkerboard, I'm going to come back here and just add a bright spot right where the sword meets the hilt. I have a sword instead of an engagement ring because my spouse gets me. That's awesome. <laughs> and now, so I'm going to basically, I'm going to come back in with white and kind of just repeat the process. So I'm going to bring it to where we've got these, you know, like I say, checkerboarding, I'm going to just 
accentuate or exaggerate each segment of the checkerboard. So here we've got our, you know, our latest point up here. So I'm gonna bring that out this way. And then here I'm gonna, you know, the middle of the bright point. I'm gonna again just do this with, you know, scribbly, almost like a sound wave, right? It's just this like, you know, like an audiogram kind of feel to it where it's just, And my idea there is that the way I started doing metals this way, because it, to me, it elicited the idea of motion. You know, it feels like the light is reflecting off of the sword as it's kind of sweeping by. It's like you've got the idea of environmental reflections, but from no particular source. Um, you know, I started doing that with Monster Apocalypse. And my first thought was that, like, he's rampaging by some buildings. And that's sort of like the shadow cast by the buildings. But I don't need, like, a specific building in a specific place. Like, I don't need to draw, like... A reflection of a high rise on his sword, right? Like it's just not it's not necessary to go that detail. I just want like the implication of there being something there. And so this kind of checkerboarding is scribbly checkerboards, I guess. I don't, I've never really come up with a name for it, but let's call them scribbly checkerboards. Is kind of my approach to, you know really, really sketchy non-metallic metal. It gets the idea of non-metallic metal down without, with no concern at all for the environment it's taking place in. And that's really what I do when I'm trying to like get a reference. I go back to 1990s era X-Men cartoon or comics, and I look at images of Colossus or Silver Surfer, or there's other characters. Um, I mean, Wolverine's actually a good example too. Look at how they're drawing his claws. And you'll get a lot of this feel to the texture. The difference is there'll be a lot of black worked in it. We're going to get there in a minute. Now, I've been able to leave gaps for my black because I know where I'm going to put it. Um, so you may find the first couple of times you do it, until you've really kind of got the black feel down, you may kind of bring your colors too close together, stuff like that. And that just comes with practice. That's also why I say like doing a miniature once in a while that's just black and white really, really helps you visualize where your black's going to go because you're always kind of I'm always painting with the idea of where my shadows are going to go be in mind but it's not you know it, it comes second nature to me at this point but it definitely you know didn't start there you know I made plenty of mistakes when I first started in the style the other thing I used to do was like I would probably have black lined every edge of that sword because they're just sharp crisp edges sharp crisp edges I can say words and one of my original ideas was anywhere you can put a black line, you should put a black line because it makes it feel more like an illustration. I started to find that it was less important to have them on the edges of miniatures than it was to have them on the like the inner details. And so that's kind of just where I've gone over time. Um, so some of my older tutorials have a lot more lining around the edges of models than they do now. All right, black magic. Let's do the fun part. Hey, at least the cat's still in the cat can. As my BSA cooking counselor would tell you, a dull sword is a dangerous blade. Sharpen early and often. Yes. So just to um, just put this away just for one sec, just to kind of talk to that checkerboard pattern. This is one of the first models I did that had a lot of non-metallic metal on it. And so the one thing I did differently is I've got the really, really deep blacks just on the sides, but then I kind of decided they'd be brighter up top here. So there's really none of that deep black up on the top. You know, it goes from, I actually ended up using the same palette. It goes from like that scrag brown into the yellows, into the scrag brown into the yellows with a little bit of white in the middle. Whereas here, I didn't bring the white in, so I kept it one tone lighter or one tone darker for the highlights, and then the shadows go completely black. Um, and, but still, we still have that checkerboard. We've got, you know, the blackest part is opposing the lightest part. Then our lightest or our darkest part here is opposed by the lightest part. They kind of, you know, we back and forth, back and forth. Um, and that 
that alternating pattern really gives a sense of motion as well. Like it, the, my idea here is like, this is him like just running down the street, barreling past some buildings. Like this is probably the reflection of a building on a very, very polished surface, but I don't need to see the building, right? It's just not important. It didn't need that kind of detailing. All right, um, black lining. This is the fun part. This is where we get to make mistakes, hide mistakes, create big bulky shadows. Now I told you before, I tend to break this down into a couple steps. There are steps in theory, because I kind of, I've just been doing this so long now, I do them all simultaneously. I'll, so I think about them in steps, but I kind of just amalgamate them. Because sometimes I look at a detail and be like, oh yeah, that needs some little sketchy shadows. And I'll just go ahead and do them while I'm sitting there looking at that one specific spot. One other thing I do when I'm doing my black lining, this model is actually not going to be too bad for it because this is a very, very simplistic model. It's got very big, easy to read details. But if I'm working on, you know, this Stormcast Eternal and there's just like, he's just like choked in detail, right? Um, it's kind of the hallmark of Games Workshop that everything's just festooned with gubbins. And what I'll do is I'm working on the black line over here and I will just rotate the model and like leave that part alone for a while and like maybe do some black line in the back of his hand and I'll turn around and do some like maybe around his belt and I jump around the model a lot and the reason for that is I find if I sit here and focus on like say these little diamonds around his chest right I'll sit there and I'll start to like do little black shadows here and then I'll decide to do a little like a crescent v to like oppose this highlight and then I'll do some little like cast off hatch marks to kind of bring that forward. And I find I spend way, if I don't leave a detail, I spend twice as long detailing it than if I kind of bounce around the model. And so then what happens is if I started doing that here, I'd spend an, you know, I'm not gonna say an hour, but I'd spend a long time kind of detailing these little tiny diamonds. And what I've just then done is set an expectation that that's my level of detail I have to approach. And suddenly now, whatever I did there, I have to hit that same consistency everywhere else on the model. And that's a trap. You know, if you have like one thing overly detailed and you want to bring everything else up to that level, suddenly it goes from being something quick and enjoyable to something like sloggy and really, I don't want to say detrimental, but it, it can, it kills some of the fun. And so what I do, and it's just, this is my process. It's what keeps me from falling into that trap is add a little bit of detail here, move around, add a little bit to this boot, move around, add some to this glove, move around, add some to his back. And I just keep rotating my way around the model, line a little, or I'll follow lines. Like I'll start, you know, at the collar, following the collar, follow along this little bit of garment, following this little vial here, following the edge of the cloak, come under the cloak, come up the leg, come across the leg. And I'll kind of like work my way around the model that way. And the point is that I'm never like sitting in one place, hyper-focusing. And that's just something, it's not part of comic style. It's just a thing that I find helps me manage expectations, keep the model, you know, more approachable and not lose my whole day to like just putting black models or black ink on one thing. Uh, so Higgins Black Magic or Dale Rowney, I've dropped on my wet palette. It doesn't really need to be on one because you don't really need water in it. You don't need to thin it. Um, but my wet palette's there and it's an easy place to put, you know, it's my, my, you know, my motion is trained to go back to the wet palette. So I just, I put it there so I don't be like, Hey, where'd I put that on my palette? Or like, I used to like, I'd take a base, I turn it over, I'd squirt some ink into it. And I'd be like, okay, wh where, which base was that? I've got 10 on the table right now, you know? Um, so I just load up a little bit of ink and what you'll see is, on, can I, I load up a little bit of ink and then I just, pull it, pull it out of the brush. I kind of just do some long strokes of the brush just to get a lot of that ink to kind of flow freely from it. And then I'll, you know, test it on, you know, the cork or on the back of my thumb or something. I want to make sure I'm getting nice little sharp, consistent lines. And if I can get those nice little crisp lines, I'm good to move on. I'm good to start inking. And so like I say, step one is just isolate the details on the model. And that's just a matter of literally outlining everything and don't worry if you make little mistakes right now like this line just came up a little bit up onto his you know his belt there more so than i wanted it to doesn't really matter at this stage i can go back in with a little bit of color i mean i don't have any color on there right now but i could go back in with a little bit of color and fix it later i could thicken up the rest of the black line to match it 
or I can just not worry about it. You know, not worrying about it is the easiest approach. Because ultimately when the whole mini is done, you're not gonna notice one or two things that have a little bit of like an extra line weight to them. And if you do, then you fix them then. So this process, be really okay with making a few mistakes and fixing them later or not at all, or incorporate the mistakes into the miniature. Like right there, I was drawing a little black line. The black line went up onto the collar a little more than I like, so I just made that into a shadow. You know, I just, okay, that line went too thick. Let's make it even thicker. Let's make it be a shadow instead. And then we just move on. Don't worry about it. And that's one of my favorite things about painting this way is it's very freeing to let your mistakes be part of the miniature. And the reason why that works is because we're using comic books as our reference and comic book artists are notoriously bad at their job. Um, we could talk all day about how terrible Rob Liefeld is, but you know, the guy produces comics on a regular basis. He keeps getting work. You know, <laughs> um, but I mean, you know, if he can, you know, publish a comic with everyone having two left feet and, you know, no wrists, we can have a couple little lines that go in the wrong places. So many pouches, right? So what I'm saying is, you know, if it's good enough for a comic book artist, it's more than good enough for us painting based on a comic book artist. So we can let the fact that we're using an imperfect medium be our reference allows us to be imperfect. So here up under the neck, this is where I sort of, like I say, I kind of, as much as there's the three-step or four-step process of like outline details, build big shadows, add the detailing, you know, when I'm adding a black line under his head, I'm probably just going to add the shadow at the same time. There's not much point in like trying to do a delicate little line and then come back later to add a shadow when like, I'm going to mess, like, there's no way I'm going to add a little black line here and not mess up. It's going to happen. I know it's going to happen. I know I'm going to bump the brush into his chin. So I might as well just like drop a shadow under his chin at the same time. And then I don't have to worry about whether I mess up because it's just part of the detail that's supposed to be there. So what I'd probably do here, he's kind of got like a big, there's a big bit of a curve here. So I'm going to just kind of bring some little, like almost hatch, not quite hatch marks, but there's like, you know, four or five little parallel lines there, then just fade into a big black morass, right? It's not a bug, it's a feature, 100%. That is probably the best way to describe what I'm doing. I don't know why I didn't think of it because I'm a software designer by my day job. Well, former day job, now I'm a painter by day job because COVID weirdly gave me some really good opportunities and I'm not looking that gift horse in the mouth. So here we've got, you know, the, the upper lip and I'm kind of trying to come in the underside of that. So I leave as much of the bottom lip as possible because the bottom lip's really not that thick a detail by comparison. And so I want to kind of, you know, bias the line towards the upper lip. Now, what you'll see, and this is where sometimes you just have to make up some shadows, have to, you know, lie a little bit. You know, because of the angle of his head, I put, you know, there's a highlight back in here that even at just like a horizontal plane, like you don't even see that. You don't see his bottom lip at all. So I could fill that bottom lip in with black and it wouldn't change the way this model reads, except for like very specific angles that no one looks at a model at. So everything underneath there could just be black and it's not going to change much. Now, once you get to the side here, excuse me. Um, then like the, the bottom lip matters over here, but like this part of the bottom lip is actually under a deep recess and it doesn't need to be detailed at all. You could just leave it plain black. When in doubt, black it out. If you don't want to work on a detail, you don't have to. I'm going to just inside his ear, I'm going to kind of just bring that, you know, kind of like a letter C shape, leave the bottom just alone, just bring this sort of little, little curl around the top. I'm gonna black out the edge of the fez here. Now, if I had colored the fez, I'd probably be, you know, trying to be a little more precise with that line, but there we are. Um, and then that line hits across the back of his eyelid. And so we wanna just, uh, or eyebrow. So I'll be a little bit careful there. I'm gonna actually line the fez a little bit, even though we didn't put color on it. 
So it's kind of got this, you know, little little crest around the edge of it. And you can see, like, I'm I'm perfectly okay with screwing up a little bit while I do this. I'm I'm very comfortable with some of the lines going in the wrong place, making them, you know, some of the lines run together. And that again comes back to comic book artists make mistakes all the time. And then they publish them. <laughs> so, you know, if I've got a couple lines that run together, it's just true to form. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. And I find that a very freeing way to think about things. Like, it's okay for this mistake to exist because I'm trying to imitate an imperfect reference. So my work should be imperfect. I should have mistakes here. Now, I didn't paint his eye. I probably should have. Are we out of focus? I feel like I'm just like ever so slightly out of focus here. One sec. There we go. That's mildly better. So we've got this kind of like a little kind of crest around the side of the nostril. So I'd probably just drink a little thin black line there. And I say this is in my numbered sequence. That's step three. I just picked up the gray by accident. Um, let me just go back in there again. But the numbered sequence doesn't necessarily reflect how I, you know, it's it's what's in my head. It's not what I actually work my way through. It's it's a good way to approach it when you're doing your first few miniatures in this style. But after all, you kind of get an idea of like where shadows should go and where they shouldn't. And you know, I can add, you know, maybe we'll freehand in a little like a wrinkle here on his nose. You know, maybe a little little furrow in his forehead. Got to get my pages turned in. Yeah, yeah. Hey, it works. Um, so now this is going to be the trickiest part. I want to kind of do the bottom of the neck adjacent to the collar without wiping the collar out. And so I'm just going to try to slide the brush in there and hope for the best. And I think we got it. So the one thing I try to think of when I'm painting miniatures for comic style is I think of miniatures as the comic book characters in their panels, not on the cover. Because cover art is a whole different ball game, right? Cover art in a comic is highly detailed. You know, it's eight, nine inches tall, right? It is the size, like a character on a comic book cover is the size of an action figure, not the size of a miniature. Whereas when you think of inside a comic book panel, they're literally the size of a miniature. And so that's kind of like the level of detail I'm trying to reach is the level of detail that goes into an action panel or even a focused panel, but not never really the cover. Because the covers are often done in very different art styles. So like a lot of comic book covers are hand painted, well, digitally now, but they have a very different, different feel, a different life to them than the you know the day-to-day -day art inside the panels. And the panels are where the action is. The panels are where the story's told. And, you know, my gaming miniatures, like I do my Riot Quest minis all in comic style. I want them to feel like they're telling a story. I want them to feel like they're in an action comic. And so they don't need to be cover art. They need to be panel art. And it's just worth thinking about that, is that, you know, if you're pulling up references, don't pull up references that are like hyper detailed because that's not really where you're going. Unless it is like, you know, you do what you want to do, but that's sort of my ethos is that I'm trying to reproduce the the dynamic action of a panel as opposed to the, you know, static stoicism of like the front cover. Um, there we go. So with an arm like this, I usually want to drop a big shadow under the arm. And the reason for that is that it gives us the ability to feel like the piece is outlined. And now here we've got a couple little folds in the fabric that meet at the bottom. So I'm going to then pull lines out of that shadow and up along the lines of the fabric. Just like that. Now this guy, he's like I said, it's a pretty simple sculpt. Some might have more 
more wrinkles than that. So we'd probably, you know, do this like two or three times over. But here we can just, you know, bring that shadow just a little bit down onto the torso because there's going to be a little bit of a drop shadow under the arm. Bring it back up a little ways just to accentuate the line here. And then just kind of repeat on the back, you know, we're going to bring this bring this line out of the armpit, kind of up about two thirds of the way around the arm or a third of the way around the arm. Now this side, there's really no sculpted wrinkles in the fabric. So I'm going to just pretend there are, I'm going to make one or two up myself. You know, I want to just have, you know, a little detailing here. I don't want to just be straight flat lines. And I'm going to drop just a little bit more shadow under the arm there. And the idea here, now I could feather that if I want to, I could do a little bit of, maybe a little cross hatching into the shadow. And I'll show you why this is important in a sec. So what this does is when the model's viewed from basically flat on or even from about, you know, a two thirds angle, we have the illusion of a black line illustrating this arm in place. And so now it looks like someone has, you know, taken this flat picture of a model and drawn a line around it. And the more places we can get that win, the more this will feel illustrated. So, I mean, I'll be able to do it the inside of the legs. This is actually a really, really easy place to do some quick shadows. I mean, I don't have any painted these yet, but it doesn't matter. I'll just, you know, take my brush and I will just scribble this one in because I know it's going to fill like a significant part of the model, you know, fill in the crotch underneath, not, you know, not the bits. And then same thing, this side on the leg, just kind of bring that all the way down to the ground and fill roughly a quarter of the leg. And then once you've done that really rough, quick fill, pull your shadows out of it onto whatever fabrics there or whatever other textures there, make some up if you want to, like I could add a little extra lining here. Maybe one more this way. And same thing on the other leg. And then I just want to go like look at the model from the back and kind of do the same thing again. Pull all your shadows out of it. So the line work here around the boot would even be an extension of that shadow. Do you ever use black paint for these thicker lines or does it not match the acrylic? Yeah, it, it visually ends up different. So I usually don't bother doing the thing is like the ink also covers really, really fast. Black paint is a slower medium in a way. Like it doesn't work as quickly because it's just not as opaque. It doesn't flow as freely from the brush. Like the thing is I can take this black ink and I can just work my way around the whole model for, you know, probably minutes at a time before I go and reload it. I reload the brush more often than I have to, I think, just because of the habit of painting. Um, you know, ink, thing is like ink is meant for writing, right? Ink flows for a long time. Because if you had to go back to the inkwell every time you wrote three or four letters, like written language would have died. <laughs> <laughs> would have been like, screw this, this is too much work. Yeah, Abaddon Black works fine. So the reason I don't like using paints Paints work fine. They're just more work to get to the same, like you get the same result. You just spend more time getting there. Um, that, that's really what it is. Like I like how freely ink flows from my brush. I like how opaque it is. You can absolutely do all this with black paint if you want to. You're probably just going to find the fact that, you know, paint is ever so slightly, um, you know, less opaque than ink is for the most part. So, you know, if you're doing a little bit of, doing a lot of like little tiny lines like cross hatching or trying to draw surface details, you might end up with the occasional one that looks gray instead of black and you gotta either go back in and touch it up or, you know, do it again or just accept the fact that it doesn't look as black as it could. And those aren't outcomes I like. You know, I really like how how dark black ink is. 
and Hagen's Black Magic specifically is just like it's a fairly fairly matte as ink goes. I mean, inks inks tend to be glossy. That's just kind of their nature. But some are much glossier than others. So I'm going to come back. I'm going to you know just detail around the wrist here. The other thing we can do too is like the, his back is just a big flat surface. There's no detail there at all, right? I just bought the Black Magic ink off Amazon for about four bucks of free shipping. Yeah, Black Magic is I just love it so much. <laughs> um, so what we might want to do? He's got his arm lifted up here, so we know there's going to be like a little bit of a pull in his jacket. So maybe we'd, you know, add a couple little lines, kind of just hinting at that, right? Doesn't need to be much. But even just that little bit, it feels more illustrated. And that's kind of the key is we want to do things that then make this feel like an illustration. Um, one of the really, really key place here is the, you know, the inside of this, uh, this inside edge of the coattails. We can just black that out. No one needs to know what's going on with the side of a coattail, right? Like it's just, it's unimportant. We can hide it. We can then spend no time coloring it or detailing it, whatever. We can then pull a couple shadows out of that dark area we've just created. We can blend it right into our other shadows if we want to. We also even just hide, like I could just hide this, like who cares if he's got, you know, we're gonna see the, the pants at the ankles or the calves. We don't necessarily even need to see that at all, right? Like this whole part here, I can get rid of all this. I can actually just take my black ink and clobber the heck out of this part of the model and it's not going to change much, if anything, with this model at all. It's just that much model I just didn't have to do any painting on, period. And that's, you know, part of why I say it's really, really cool to, you know, do a practice piece where you just do the black and white. Because once you realize that, like, there was nothing to do there, I was going to just erase it anyway. Why would I spend time coloring that, you know? I know I'm going to color the outside of his pants, but up inside his crotch, we don't see it. We don't need to see it. And by creating a black share, a black shadow in there, it actually breaks, you know, it, again, we create more depth, we create the idea that like the, the coat is even closer to us. You know, it, it, it deepens the model. So let's see here. Where are we here? We did the face. The face in this guy, so you know, we could do some free handing on the face too. If we want, you know, little whiskers or something, we just bring them in here. And this again really starts to sell that illustrated feel, right? We illustrate it. I said that wrong. Illustrated feel. Uh, I want to do the same now around his. He's got a monocle here. I want to be a little bit careful around it. I don't want thick black lines because I want the monocle to feel kind of delicate and kind of like the thicker your lines are the weightier something feels and so here we kind of want purposely you know fairly delicate line work so i'm trying to be really meticulous in this case about how uh how thin those lines get. You see, I'm doing all this lining from the big thick shadows down to these really, really small lines. I've been doing this all with a single brush. This is a, I think a size zero. It's more important that your brush has a fine point than a really, really small body. Because with the ink, you actually want a decent body of ink in the brush. Um, the body being like this, everything in the brush kind of like, you know, behind the tip, right? It's where your reservoir of whatever you're painting with or inking with gets stored in the brush. And when you've got a really small brush, there's not a big reservoir. And so you end up going back to your palette more often. And so it's, you know, good body with a small point is kind of like the ideal inking brush because it gives you a lot of control. You can use the body, you know, the side of the body to do like your big shadows. Luckily, I grew up on comics in the mid-50s. Oh, 
yeah, I'm jealous. There is some great material from that era that suits miniatures really, really well. Because the thing with miniatures is like, because of their size, because they're so small, like often miniatures have less detail than the average comic book character does, especially like a modern comic book character, I should say. Modern comics have the benefit of digital production, which means people can zoom in on details. They can, you know, ink them with gradients and textures and, you know, they can trace images. They can do all sorts of things that like comic book artists from you know, the gold age and the bronze age or gold age and silver age just didn't do, you know, didn't have access to, couldn't do, not just didn't do, but literally could not do. Um, and so you get a more, like, the further back you go in comic history, the more authentically hand-drawn everything is. Um, and that can be really, really beneficial for this style of painting because, of course, we are doing this all by hand. And what's really cool with this character specifically is he's got, like, the almost exact same level of details, like, you know, a golden era, like, four-color hero. He's kind of just like at that same level for a character. And that's also the point in comic time where there wasn't really like a lot of distinction between the cover art and the like inside of the comic. It was kind of like one in the same. I used to love the real life comics illustrating the classics. Yes. One of my favorites for me is just like pulp comics, like space opera type stuff. Because it's just so like, the aliens are always so ridiculous in a fun way. Um, what ink am I using? I'm using Higgins Black Magic. Uh, that's this one right here. So I'm just, you know, between the hand and the, the hilt of the sword, I just filled that right in with black. I didn't bother trying to have any kind of like, you know, draw a line around the hand and then fill this in with brown and then draw another line. I just filled it with black. You don't need to see it. It's not important. We can just clobber the detail. And clobbering the details is like one of the best parts about the style. It's like, eh, this looks like too much work. Gone. Just, just you know, just toast something. Just get rid of it. I'm um, going to put a little little hit of color on or black on his knuckles here. Just kind of maybe pull out a little bit of the wrinkle here in his hand. Um, so now let's go back to black nomatalk metal. We got about 15 minutes left here. Yeah. I think we'll probably be done on time. Um, what I'll do is I will. I'll do my best to finish this up in the next 15 minutes. I think we're going to be fine there. What I'll do is I'll stay behind for the extra 10 minutes or so. So if people want to do like a little bit of a Q&A or want to post pictures of what they're working up on in Discord and I can kind of like pull them up and talk about them. I'm, it is a great comic word. Um, you know, I, I'm happy to do that. And feel free, like if you want to, that, you know, the RVE Discord's there, I assume all the time. So you know, if you want to post your stuff up tonight, tomorrow, over the weekend, whenever, um, don't feel like you have to do it by the end of class today. Like, I will pop in there over the weekend when I get time, and I will, you know, review whatever people post. Or if, you know, you want to reach out to me privately, that's okay, too. You can just ping me in Discord. So what I'm doing now is I'm bringing that, you know, the black ink into my checkerboard pattern of non-metallic metal. And I'm doing basically just tiny little letter H's. See, it's just a letter H. Um, the top of the sword here, I might not bring any black in because I want it to feel, you know, like the shiniest point on the sword. Um, but here I might, because we've kind of got a bit of a, like an opposing triangle here. Like it's not really, you know, it's kind of facing two different directions. So I just kind of brought a little black into the corner instead. 
Could people post comics artists or games that are as dungeon that match the comic style for reference things on Discord? I'm please do, yeah. You also can, I've got a Discord as well where we have a lot of comic style enthusiasts. So if it's something you want to kind of continue pursuing, you know, beyond uh, beyond RVE, um, epicduck.com slash Discord will always be a live invite link. You can let yourselves in. <laughs> And so here, same idea. Um, I'm not really, I'm going to draw a black line just right there between the hand and the metal. But I'm just putting these little, you know, sort of sound wave style scribbles. And they're really, really small and tightly focused. Just opposite my highlights. Darkest Dungeon is also a really, really fun style to paint in because one thing they do in Darkest Dungeon, and no one really catches this until they start to deconstruct the art, no one has eyes. Their eyes are filled with black ink. So if you're the kind of person that hates painting eyes, Darkest Dungeon is the perfect style to work on because you literally get to omit the eyes on every model. You just get to pretend they're not there. The only thing I think in Darkest Dungeon that has eyes was like a sort of like Shogoth style creature that like had a giant eyeball, but like none of the characters do. The characters just have these like dark grimacing faces where like their eyebrows just cast a shadow over their whole face. Oh, a couple questions here. Where do you get it, please? I just get it from is Higgins water based? Yes, it is. Um, actually, I don't know if it's water based or not. It is waterproof? I don't know what it's actually based on. I feel like it was acrylic last time I looked into it, but I don't have an answer for you. Um, I get it from. I get mine from Michaels. Higgins is a. It's a very broadly available brand. It's available from almost any fine art store. Other than the usual outline that is obvious, how else do you really choose where else to place? Um, so. Outlines I feel are obvious, like, you know, I'm outlining the cuff, it's going to go between the wrist and the hand. Um, the second thing I do is shadows, and what I kind of do is I look at the model from underneath. Now, like I say, I, I do these things now kind of as I paint, so they're not necessarily always going to be in the same places, or like, I don't have to look at the model from underneath to know where a shadow goes now, it's just like I've done it a bunch of times. But I'll look at the model underneath and be like, okay, I want a black line under this arm because I want the feel of like an illustrated outline on the arm. And I can kind of just carry that all the way forward. You can see I brought the black line up onto the cuff and even a little bit onto the bottom of the hand. Um, the second thing is places where there's kind of like folds in the model. So like, for example, there's like a little tiny, you know, just a little line between the, you know, the left lip and the right lip. So you to get it from Michaels and Amazon. Yeah, Amazon is a terrible place to get art supplies in Canada. I don't know why that is, but like, most art supplies aren't native to amazon.ca. They're usually like amazon.com imports and then they add the duty into the price. And so it gets, anyway, I can rant about that for ever a day. <laughs> yeah, amazon.ca is generally the last place you should be buying art supplies unless like for some reason they're Japanese imports because those seem to be nice and cheap. Don't, I don't know, don't ask me. Um, yeah, so it's sort of like, it's a three-step process or a four-step process for adding black ink. His first one is breaking the model into its kind of constituent, just geometries, you know, separating it apart. The next one is the details in the details, like the little, you know, filling in the nostril, you know, the crease around the eyebrow, the little line between the lips, stuff like that. There's sort of like where I've got like one area. Hey pups, can you wait like five minutes, buddy? Um, even like the little line here, you know, there's a little little crease in his jacket there. So it's like, I call that the details and the details. The third step is the big black shadows. And the fourth step is any, any sort of little, um, you can wash your breath with water, it's water-based. Yes, there you go. I was water-based, I keep on looking at my brush and you know, I'm still here, so. <laughs> Um, 
then the last one would be if I want to go one detail level further and start adding in, a, you know, hatching shadows. So that's kind of where I start to do these little tiny, you know, parallel lines. And I don't do this on every model because this, once you commit to doing this, it's a time consuming process. But it really adds a level of flavor to the model. Excuse me, that I think a lot of them really, really take well to. Um, so, for example, like coming out underneath the, uh, you know, coming out of the head here, and just working a tiny little sequence of, you know, parallel lines, and just just lightly tapping the tip of the brush to the model. Like there's there's almost not quite no contact, but it's very very minimal. But that creates what I love about that is that is effectively what a wash does for you. If you have time, can you show a quick sample of stippling? Um, I think I've got a model I've done that on. I do not. So yeah, we can we can do that. Um, we got seven minutes. Uh, the brushes I use are the Game Envy Artist Arsenal brushes. I use the size zero and triple zero for doing my lining. Um, yeah, so when you do these little tiny, you know, hatch marks, these little tiny. Hey, puppy, you gotta wait five minutes, okay, bud? I might have to just go feed my dog really quick. He, he is a freaking alarm clock when it comes to dinner. Yeah, yeah, bud. Um, <laughs> I made a step away here for one second to do that because otherwise he's just going to moan the whole time. I'm sorry, I will be right back. <laughs> the puppers is hungry yes um where was i here so yeah the, these little lines they basically kind of create the same the same value transition that a wash would do right you know a wash gives you a gradient from you know from your base coat into your shadow and these lines do very much the same thing i'll do them against a white here so it's a little easier to see um, you know, by creating a bunch of these and having them taper, we create a transition from a bright spot into the black. And that transition has a gradient to it. You know, it's definitely darker over here than it is over here. Um, what do you use for detail? Like the button. Ink is, yeah, yeah, I'll still, generally I'll ink them as well. Like little buttons like this, I'll usually just draw a line underneath them. I won't trace all the way around them because it's usually a pain in the butt, to be honest. Um, it's also just not necessary. So I'll usually just drop a black line kind of on the bottom side of a button. I'll, you know, maybe cover like two thirds or three quarters of the shape of the button like that. Um, a model with a lot of rivets, for example, um, what I'll, like war machine models are, you know, festooned with rivets. They're just everywhere. Um, what I'll do for them is I'll take a little bit of like null oil and just tap it. Kitty cam for the filler. <laughs> yes. Um, let me just grab some null oil here. If I can. It's way over there because I wasn't planning to use it. <laughs> Where are you? Not the gloss. Or is it right here in front of me and I missed it? Agrax. Uh, you know, what? I'll just show with Agrax because I don't know where I put my null oil right now. Which means it's right beside me or right in front of me. It is right in front of me. Wow. I had to reach past it to get the other one. Um, yeah, so what I'll do with like a model with a lot of rivets, I'll use, you know, a null oil. I'll load the same brush up and I'll just try and put it you know around the rip because null oil in this case just the way it sinks into that crevice because ink kind of stays where you put it that's the key difference right you touch ink to something that spot is colored yeah you gotta use the washroom washer now don't you dog okay one sec i am gonna have to just pause for a second while i let the dog out so i guess well yeah sounds like my painting desk <laughs> Um, yeah, so you can see like it, it doesn't give you quite as stark a black line like as it dries it'll have a little bit of a feather to it. But 
when you've got like 30, 40 rivets on a model, it saves enough time and it looks consistent enough that it's worth it. And you can always come back with a little bit of black line and just like, you know, drop a little line underneath one or two of them to kind of like just sharpen that line up just a little bit. And so kind of, you can use a couple cheat codes like that. Null Noil is kind of my cheat code for black lining when I just don't want to deal with the detail. Um, chain mail is a great example, like the chain mail on this guy. That's just no, or that's actually a contrast black Templar over a base coat. Okay, one second. Sorry, the dog needs out. I will be right back. All right, Andy, have a good one. I will talk to you on Monday and I'll be right back, everybody else. <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> this just became the most relatable mini penny stream I've ever seen. Yeah, the dog likes to do that to me. Usually he does it like three minutes after I start my show. All right. Um, stippling. No, we don't have time for stippling, I guess. <laughs> we ran out of time. I'm trying to think if I have a model I've done it on nearby that might. He's pretty much flat colors. Yeah, I don't think I've actually got one. I've done a couple models in that style, but they've all been for commission and they've all left me. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah, none of them are here. Do you typically start in white or black primer? Always white for this. I start as bright as I can. Um, if I'm doing it off camera, I will start with pure white primer. If I'm doing it for film, I will start with a black, like this was prime black and then like two coats of white and then like a zenithal priming. And the reason for that is that a pure white miniature just like messes with the camera. Like it just, it throws off the white balance and the exposure. So if I'm doing it for camera work, I'll do zenithal priming. If I'm doing it for myself, I'll just prime white. What do you use for details like the button? Oh, I answered that one. Okay. Yoink and yoink. There we go. And yeah, I think that's that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> Any other questions? Feel free to post them. I'm here for a few more minutes. I'm going to take a quick peek at the Discord, see if anyone has popped anything in there. Can you share your Discord link? Yeah, I will pop that in there in a moment. Can we get a nice shot front straight on? Absolutely. Yeah, you're very welcome. This is honestly like I discovered this style of painting, what, three years ago. And it's just, it's become almost an addiction for me. Like when I don't do it for a while, I start to get like disappointed in myself. <laughs> oh, it's so good on crisis protocol. Actually, I don't think I showed you guys any crisis protocol stuff. Hang on. It's all behind me. Okay, I'll show you like two of my favorite pieces here. Let me get one more. Okay, so this is the most time I've ever spent painting a piece of terrain. <laughs> I 
was reminded that we just got the Bloodborne game in and now I have a mini painting goal and lots of practice to do. Awesome. Uh, thanks for the awesome class, for your informative and techniques, inspiring. I'm glad to hear that. So yeah, this was this is the most fun I've ever had painting a piece of terrain because I like, actually this has a lot of dry brushing on it. The base coat here is too, it's dark gray or like, um was Citadel the Fang then dry brush with Fenrisian gray. So it was a little bit of stippling up kind of in this area, mostly just dry brushing though and worked pretty well for just building some quick texture. Um, this is probably my favorite thing I've done all, in all time because like there's a lot, Modoc is kind of funny because you're effectively bus painting because his head is just so huge. So I went really, really to town on like the skin detailing. Um, this is where I went more cover art than comic panel, right? I kind of went in that skew. Um, it's just so fun though, I love this piece. And then a little bit of whiskey nose going on because why not? And one more I gotta show you guys. This is literally my favorite thing I've ever done. Um, Venom based on the 1990s Spider-Man series. Because in that series, Venom always had a blue light on his left and a red light on his right. And it had nothing to do with the scene, had nothing to do with the set he was on. I think it was a way to make him look like oily and kind of alien just you know he didn't really belong in the scenes he was in right um and that's not color shift too right yeah no the, that's just that's just some blue paint on one side and some red paint on the other side that's all that is wow um there's only five color not counting the tongue there's only five well six colors we count the white there's only six colors on this model plus the tongue um two shades of blue two shades of red black white and then, yeah, his tongue's kind of like just goes to town because. <laughs> but yeah, I looked at a whole bunch of animation stills from the, that 90s Spider-Man cartoon because that was like the definitive introduction to Venom for me. And so I used that as my source. And first character in Marvel Crisis Protocol, there's like basically an anti-hero where he's like undecidedly neither a hero nor a villain. And I spent way too long in my earlier years playing the game City of Heroes. And if you play City of Heroes, you either played a hero or a villain and they were denoted as being, like people called them blue side and red side. And I thought it was really funny that Venom has a blue side and a red side. And is both a hero and a villain. So it's just like, it, it brought all these things together for me. Like it ties City of Heroes into this comic book of my art youth and like into a tabletop war game. And I just like, it was like the perfect amalgamation of projects. <laughs> Every time you speak, the camera switches to you and the screen goes blank with white text. Oh, um, you can, you should be able to focus. I mean, I guess we're over now, so it's kind of irrelevant. But... I mean, this is a good time to discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can focus soon. speaker but there's a way to just like view one person's camera i just gotta remember i don't remember where that is off the top of my head but you can do it um anything left in the q a i think i accidentally closed it <laughs> uh no we've marked those i just forgot to click done on them okay it's empty cool thank you All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're done here then. So if you've got, if you want feedback on anything you've painted today or anything you even try to do in the style in the near future, I'll post a link to my discord in my channel on Reaper's discord, or you can just post in Reaper's discord. I'll be there too. So either or, you know where to find me. And I'm painting three days a week, all day, basically on Twitch Monday, currently Monday, Tuesday, and Friday. We're probably moving to Tuesday to Wednesday, but for discord yeah i'll pop it uh, it's epicduck.com slash discord um but i will pop that into the reaper discord too so you can find it there and i think we're done here thanks everybody for coming it's been really fun glad to have all y'all here